works. And Fantastic. Well, I'm not going to say anything else, just the floor is yours. Oh, so that's lovely. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello to your online participants. I'm Matthias Ketteman. Um, so I work at the uh, Department uh, of uh, Theory and Future of Law in Innsbruck. I also head research groups at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin and the Leibniz Institute for Media Research in um, Hamburg. And I've recently created the Innsbruck Quantum Ethics Lab Equal, which is proud to join the family of excellence, institutes of excellence for quantum research, if I may be so bold as to cite, as to, as to show where we want to head towards. And I'm going to offer a couple of thoughts on responsible governance of quantum technologies. The future, the European Union reminds us, is quantum. Yes, that's good to know. But what does that mean? What does this second quantum revolution mean? Uh, Austria and German media are full of uh, headlines like with quantum computers, we can predict the future. Or on the right side, the founder of Terra Quantum, a startup, those who don't have access to quantum technology will become third world countries. How to avoid that, you've seen in the presentation before me. Now, both of those dimensions, namely the intertemporal dimension of protecting freedom, also from uh, cognition-based predictions as to the design of the future, and the equal distribution of access to quantum technologies obviously raises questions of regulation, of governance. What are the key questions? The same as in any new field. Why regulate? When to regulate? What to regulate? And how to regulate? And I'll, answer, I'll um, add a couple of thoughts on all of those points. Uh, and I'm very happy to engage in a more in-depth discussion now or, or later. First of all, <clears throat> why why regulate? Well, why why do we do anything? We do things to uh, make the world a slightly better place, or in uh, legal terms, uh, we try to ensure individual spheres of freedom and public values, like social cohesion, like uh, plurality of opinion as it relates to the democratic constitution of our state and of the international community. Now, specifically with regard to quantum technology, we uh, have recognized the technologists among us better than others, that the innovation potential associated with quantum technology can trigger processes of social change, even if we cannot yet quite predict the future. Social change influences social norms. It can change the production and implementation of social norms and of social mores. Of course, social mores, the changes in social mores can also lead to processes of social change. Those two dimensions are interlinked. Now, norms can intervene at every single step of that uh, change, of those change processes. Norms can influence processes of change. They can stop them. They can enhance them. They can provide um, a frame. They can provide a, an orientation, they can provide a telos, a goal. Those norms need to be well drafted. They need to ensure the freedom to innovate and preserve our rights and our freedoms. That's already at this point a clear uh, signal, a clear point to make against this argument that regulation is the enemy of innovation. No. Bad regulation, bad governance is the enemy of innovation, but bad governance, bad regulation is also the enemy of freedom uh, more broadly. Generally, bad regulation is bad. So we need norms. We need norms to ensure both the freedom to innovate and to preserve our rights and to preserve social cohesion. Let's not retrace uh, the, let's not do the same mistakes we've committed when regulating data protection, where we took too much care to protect individual spheres of freedom and failed to protect social goods and collective rights. Uh, 
When should we regulate? Well, the time of governance depends. Uh, we know that from AI norm making. We know that from platform uh, rule making on the risk we're seeing, we expect to see. If it's a high risk setting, rules should be provided ex ante. If it's a medium risk setting, rules can be provided ex durante, so during the implementation phase. And if these are low risk settings, rules can be provided in an ex post perspective. So to first see what, in what, uh, what technology brings and then whether any social costs need to be alleviated or redistributed. Now, this, of course, asks, doesn't need to answer the question, when should we regulate, right? No, but it asks, it answers the question, what should be the factors influencing our decision when to provide good rules? The, um, the normative endeavor you've seen described in the previous presentation is a good example of providing soft rules recommendations in an ex ante scenario, right? You should not go for hard rules ex ante before knowing empirically what dangers are on the horizon. You could provide hard rules in ex durante settings, so as they are being applied, but it's usually better to provide hard rules ex post when dangers are close to realization. So now is the time to engage in soft law rulemaking, the very place where not law is to be situated, but rather in other category of social norms, of powerful social norms that is also binding and that is deeply anchored in our values and protects them. And that's the realm of ethics. So that's one of the reasons why soft law norms, ethical norms, are now best placed to provide guidance. How, how should we regulate? Well, there are four traditional modes of governance through laws, through social norms, through market forces enacting a certain distribution of uh, power at the moment of transaction, and through the underlying architecture, infrastructure, and code. You can provide regulation through laws. You can uh, engage in self-regulation, often through standards, and you can approach a field through regulated self-regulation. That is to say, provide rudimentary framework rules by law or by binding norms with the ability of the community uh, in question to provide additional, more detailed, more granular rules in a self-regulation scenario. That is often, especially when it comes to specialized technology, high technology, a good approach. It worked with video games, for instance. It works with youth protection in uh, video gaming industries. It uh, works to a large degree with regard to uh, fighting terrorism uh, in online uh, platforms, uh, to fighting terrorism financing. It works rather uh, convincingly also with regard to CSAM materials, the child sexual exploitation material. But we've also seen the limits when we look at platform governance. Regulated self-regulation fails when uh social costs increase as they have over the last years regarding the impact of the optimization of platform uh, orders of uh, the algorithmically optimized platform orders on uh, economic goals and not on social and societal values Good governance is always context sensitive. That is to say, it realizes, recognizes, and uh, is keenly aware of the embeddedness of technology within a certain societal constellation. Good governance is deeply connected to the power relations in any given order. It either reinforces or destabilizes them depending on the goal 
we have when regulating. Sometimes rules are there, are made to um, reinforce a certain power relation. Sometimes they are being drafted to destabilize existing power relations and to provide a different normative equilibrium. Good governance supports emancipatory processes in um, dimensions such as gender, uh, post in a post-colonial perspective, uh, with a view to uh, a, the racial uh, dimension. Those are the classical critical uh, dimensions of emancipatory processes within power relations. In light of that, and also taking up some of the ideas uh, contained in the principles developed from by the WEF, uh, Responsible governance of quantum technology must be based on and learn from best practices from the last century of technology and communication governance. It must be democratically legitimate, more democratically legitimate than current attempts to regulate platforms. Further international solidarity and further intergenerational justice to ensure and in both an intertemporal and an international uh, redistribution of, uh, of, of limited uh, uh, goods. What are the key lessons we can draw from the failures of previous tech governance, especially uh, platform governance? Well, we see that uh, if we leave powers alone, they develop their own orders. They develop their own orders of power, like platforms have done in the past. Those are then either public or private or hybrid. They're either private orders, public orders, or they mix elements. Meta's order, for instance, would be a hybrid order. It's private in nature, but it has substantial implications for public communication functions. And a number of courts, at least in Germany, France, Luxembourg, Czech Republic, Italy, and Greece, have recognized that um, horizontally human rights apply within private parties on platforms, thus publicizing that order. Those orders are based on individual contracts, but as they privatize gains and externalize social costs, interventions through laws are necessary and legitimate. However, as we are seeing now, they often come too late. We have to avoid that when we design good rules for quantum governance. We have to design rules which answer to the pressing social questions, to the pressing technological needs, and to the pressing uh, responsibility that states have to respect, protect, and implement human rights. Now we have to ask ourselves, how do we do that? How do we ensure public values in tech orders, especially in private tech orders? Well, we can either look for the so-called rule of law approach, which is the one looking at uh, applying at applying uh, the rule of law, or one looking at the multi-stakeholder dimension. The difference here is one approach says we need to make sure the constitution reigns supreme. The other one says we need to make sure that most social groups that are important are included in the development of new government's norms. So would you rather say have the parliament contribute to governance processes or a community forum or a mini public one selected where, where people uh, selected uh, from a larger pool of societal actors can contribute? Right now, this is happening with regard to platforms. Platforms are currently being both externally regulated and internally democratized through platform councils, platform Bayerete. Meta, Facebook has given itself an oversight board. It's quasi, quasi external judicial system because they're seeing substantial legitimacy issues. As Meta is building up the metaverse, for instance, so it's called Horizons World, Meta's version of the metaverse. Currently, they're organizing what they call the world's largest stakeholder engagement through community forums in 15 countries with more than 2,000 participants. 
They're asking all of those people, how can we draft better rules to counter hate speech and harassment, harassment in private spaces? So they're asking the people to develop rules with them, for them, to then apply them in private orders, in their private metaverse, in order to gain legitimacy, right? And that's an important lesson to draw. Any rules that we need to develop, any rules that we want to develop, need to be tied to democratic values. And the, uh, uh, the WEF's um, approach, as we've seen, is an example of an approach that's recognizant of that. Stakeholders were consulted. Perhaps more could have been consulted, but stakeholders were involved. Different um, stakeholders were able to give inputs. The more, the better. Perhaps we should create something like the Internet Governance Forum, but for quantum. I don't know whether you know of the Internet Governance Forum. It's the world's largest conference on Internet governance. It's a, a major international conference each year. It just happened last week in Ethiopia. Uh, often the UN Secretary General joins. There is a high level panel, including Nobel Peace Prize winners and the father of the Internet, the Windsurf, who come together with um, between one and 3,000 participants. In 2019, it took place in Berlin with Angela Merkel and the UN Secretary General both speaking and talking about the future of the Internet architecture. It's one of the, you know, the um, well, it isn't actually a secret, right? The opposite of a secret. It's something which just doesn't really engage yet a lot of people's, let's say, intellectual energy. They just don't care. But perhaps as we're designing better rules for quantum technology governance, such an institution might make sense here to develop a world quantum parliament, a world quantum governance initiative where we can actually talk about the values we hold dear how do we ensure intertemporal justice how do we ensure intergenerational justice in the application of quantum technology because those are important issues i know this is not a legal uh a legal conference but you you are aware of where we are right now right we were in Karlsruhe, in Karlsruhe, that's the, the seat, you know, the, the holy, the holiest city of German constitutional law. Some, um, wait a second, train station is there, so it's down there. Some, um, uh, some two kilometers from here is the seat of the Bundesverfassungsgericht. And uh, in March of last year, the court uh, passed one of the more important judgments it has ever done on the constitutionality of the Federal Climate Change Act. And in that, in that judgment, which I implore you to, to read in its entirety, it's beautifully written, perhaps even too beautifully, because there are some legal problems it glosses over, but you know, that's the thing. Some judgments are there to be enjoyed and some judgments are there to be implemented. Unfortunately, this seems to be one of those to be rather enjoyed and to be implemented, but at least it's there to enjoy. Uh, I can quote from that. As intertemporal guarantees of freedom, fundamental rights afford protection against threats to freedom caused by uh, greenhouse gas reduction burdens being unilaterally offloaded onto the future. So already today, we have to provide good rules, good governance, in order to ensure that future generations do not suffer from bad rules that offloads responsibilities to save the world on future generations. And that's why we're here. That's why we have to think today about good rules for quantum governance, not only because it's the right thing to do, because this is something which we have to do. This is not about climate change. Well, it, in a certain way, it is about climate change because, of course, you know, the use of um, the use of 
large-scale quantum technology also has climate change implications. But more generally, we are setting governance standards, rules for the future of quantum governance. And this is something that our children and their children have, will have to deal with. And it is not constitutionally acceptable or ethically permissible to offload risks to the future. If there are news stories now, as the one I've shown, telling us we can predict the future with quantum technologies, well, then this is an issue that we have to raise and we have to look at what norms we need to develop to reduce risks associated with such claims. We have to ensure, therefore, through good governance norms, international solidarity and cooperation, with a view to implementing existing commitments, like the Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda. I have to admit, I haven't yet checked the um, Davos recommendation, whether there is a reference to the Sustainable Development Goals. Perhaps you can um, uh, illuminate that point for me. If it isn't, why isn't it? If it is, fantastic. But if it isn't, this is an important aspect. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are key to understanding the direction which all initiatives by international actors should be uh, targeted at. The German government has realized that. In the latest uh, iteration of the German strategy for international digital diplomacy launched just one week ago, we read, for Germany and the EU, and that's from an official German government document, right? This is the strategy of the German government. The implementation of a socio-ecological feminist transformation of global economic systems towards resilient structures is essential in the global competition of systems in the face of the turning point of time. This can only succeed if we continue to support our partners in the global south in sustainably transforming themselves digitally to fight against hunger and poverty, pandemics and climate change, and discrimination against women. For a number of these aspects, good governance of quantum technologies also plays an important role. Let's be aware of the normative frame in which our debate is situated and the yardsticks which already exist against which to measure our progress and in which at which to in light in the light of which to develop good recommendations so what should we regulate quantum sensing with a view to its potential implications for surveillance scenarios that surpass radar capabilities sonar lidar capabilities quantum computing as it relates to information on lending and investment decisions as it informs lending and investment decisions, quantum communication in light of its implications for crypto or cryptography. And how should we go about that now? Should we use the EU's approach of divide and conquer? The EU uh, is targeting digital tools and digital technologies in a very particular way with digital uh, rules on services, markets, AI, data, data governance, value chains, cybersecurity, cyber resilience, media freedom, digital identity, platform work, product liability, and product safety. And those are just those that have been passed and are about to be passed within the last six months and the next six months. There is a fundamental new playing field in digital technology regulation coming up within the next year. Now is a good time to also provide rules for quantum technology. That's just an overview of the European Parliament's work on all of those fields that I've mentioned to illustrate that now is the time, 2022 to 2023, to get active. So let me come to a conclusion. Why regulate? 
to protect the individual, to protect collective rights, to protect social cohesion, to protect international solidarity in an intertemporal, intergenerational, international dimension. When to regulate? As soon as threats begin to materialize, and that is now. What to regulate? Not so much the applications which we can yet foresee, but the underlying technology in light of potential applications. As soft as it is necessary, in light of the um, materialization of threats, and as hard as we need it. And how to regulate? Well, my argument would be to leverage ethics at this point. Hard law doesn't work at this point, I would submit. We would need to leverage ethics. We need to learn from the history of using ethics to shape the discourses and narratives of, of and on artificial intelligence. And we have about 200 documents that help us because AI ethics have been a big issue for international organizations and national um, bodies for the last five years. There's a collection by Algorithm Watch that has 187 AI ethics declarations, AI ethics recommendations. Let's leverage them. Let's have a look, for instance, at the latest UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. See their approach. See how they leverage it to come to certain goals with regard to ensuring gender diversity, avoiding intersexual discrimination, ensuring intergenerational justice, ensuring international justice. I was able to write an implementation paper for that and present it in the Bundestag two months ago. Let's do that also for quantum technology. And let's leverage technology to regulate technology. Yesterday evening, as I was using the late night train to come up here, I played around a bit with chat GBT, the newest natural language um, AI engine. And I asked it what, you can't see that very well, but the question I posed was, what principles, what ethical principles should we apply to quantum technology? And the program answered, the ethical principles of applying QT should be similar to the ethical principles applying to other fields and technologies and may include ensuring responsible use, respecting privacy and personal rights, considering potential long-term consequences, being transparent and accountable in the use of that technology, being open to public scrutiny and oversight, ensuring that the technology is used in a fair and equitable manner. I'm pretty impressed. In, in addition to these general principles, the ethical use of quantum technology may also require specific considerations, especially with regards to the possibility to break exist, existing encryption systems. And it is important for everybody to be mindful of these ethical considerations. I, I mean, that's pretty awesome, if I may say so, in my scientific uh, evaluation. Uh, and I say that because I've just spent, um, well, three months or so in analyzing the key principles underlying the uh, uh, AI ethic recommendations. And I've come up with a couple of guidelines which to my mind, sound very much like the thing that this engine came up with between, I think it was München East and München Central yesterday. So I'm kind of, well, surprised and happy about how technology progresses. Anyway, so my conclusions are the ones the uh, chat bot also had. So, we have to ask yourselves, how can we, and I think that's a point which hasn't been made like that before, but I think it's important to make it. How can we leverage existing ethics? You're my number one too. Um, how can we leverage existing ethics to shape quantum ethics? And I think AI ethics might lead the way.
They might show us how to go about that. And that's what I want to do also in Innsbruck with Equal. That is our Innsbruck Quantum Ethics Lab. We started that uh, one, um, one month ago now, and we're very much looking forward for partners, looking forward to cooperation. Our rector is also very happy. He's a physicist himself, and he's a big fan of anything connected to quantum ethics. And it's the first time that he wrote back to me to an email that I sent him within a week or so. This time he wrote back within 10 minutes when I suggested creating the Institute for Quantum Ethics Lab, which I think goes to show that he has a positive list for terms like quantum and is blacklisting all my other queries regarding getting another secretary. Anyway, so we created the Innsbruck Quantum Ethics Lab with a lot of internal partners and three startups, and we are going to start working on standards and ethics with them. And I would very much enjoy cooperating with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthias. And now, sadly, we cannot accept any questions because we have to move to the panel. Uh, but, you know, if you have any questions that, uh, you know, you would like to ask Matthias, I'm sure he has his email on the screen. You can send him an email. And for those who are here, you can just uh, ask him during the coffee break.